CB8 Speaks, a monthly program of Community Board 8 in Manhattan. Community Board 8 is defined by the Upper East Side of Roosevelt Island, and the Upper East Side is the East 59th Street to 96th Street, 5th Avenue East River area. And tonight's program is about people who have been on the board for many years who have a lot of information to share. And tonight's guest, we're really happy to have Jane Parshall. She is a very talented, very intelligent woman, and we are thrilled to have her. She has been one of the leaders of the Landmarks Committee for a very long time. Landmarks is a tremendous, tremendous committee because the Upper East Side has so many important, beautiful buildings. And Jane, thanks for joining us. Well, I'm thrilled to be here, Monica. CB8 Speaks is an important part of our mission. It, it, allows us to send, to let a larger audience know exactly what the community board is all about. And you're right. The Landmarks Committee, to me, is the most important committee within the community board. And the reason for that is, is that there are eight individual landmark districts and over 120 individual landmarks within the geographic area that comprises community board eight. Within that area, most of the geography that is west of Lexington all the way to Fifth Avenue is within a landmark district. You have the Upper East Side Historic District. You have the Metropolitan Museum Historic District. You have the Carnegie Hill Historic District and then the expanded Carnegie Hill Historic District. So all of those blocks are all within historic districts. And if any property owner wants to make any change to their brownstone, to the front elevation of an apartment building, to the area way, they want to add a rooftop addition, they want to extend into the rear yard, they have to, and they file for a certificate of appropriateness at the Landmarks Commission, they first come to us, the Landmarks Committee. We are the first step in the public approval process, and we hold the initial public hearing on the application. They're called applications, in case you didn't know. And the application is for a certificate of appropriateness, which means that you go to, finally to the commission, and the commissioners will decide, yay or nay, whether you may proceed with your application. They will either deny the certificate of appropriateness or give you permission to do what you would like. It's a tough road to hoe because these are property owners who pay taxes to the city by and large. The museums within the historic districts don't, of course, like the Metropolitan Museum or the Guggenheim, but property owners, apartment buildings are considered property owners. They pay taxes. So we have to be aware of the fine balance there. We also have to be for a certain amount of progress, even though we, of course, want to preserve the beauty, especially of the individual landmarks, we are very cognizant that there's always going to be some form of development in any major city or in any landscape in the entire world. The streetscapes are always changing. That's great that you've explained that it's the first step of the process. And as part of the community board, it's very interesting because the, the members of the board, and especially the leadership, and especially you, um, have a great deal of knowledge about the landmarks. But this is the chance for the public to hear what's going on. It just doesn't go right to the city leadership. This is, um, th the public can come and listen, um, and they can watch on Zoom. And they can testify. Exactly, exactly. And of course, you know, the, we usually mention at the end of the program, but we encourage people to attend the meetings and the calendar for these types of meetings are on the cbm.com website. It's really important for everyone to know that. And I've been to several meetings and they are so fascinating between um, the topics discussed and the knowledge of the people who were involved and the way you and your, your co-chair handle the testimonies that come in from the developers, from the architects, and from the Well, public. it's usually the architect that presents for the applicant. And I am very lucky to have a co-chair, David Halpern, who is a practicing architect, and who, with various projects, has appeared before the commission, gone to community boards, and then gone to the commission. 
without him, I, I feel that we wouldn't be doing as good a job, mm -hmm. really. But there are right now about eight other members of the board, in addition to David and myself, to sit on the Landmarks Committee. We typically meet on the third Monday of every month. So tonight, there is a Landmarks Committee meeting, and we will be hearing two applications. These applications are really not that controversial, but we have had very controversial applications in the past. To name one that happened recently would be the Frick Museum, which came to us because it's within the Upper East Side Historic District. It's an, it's an individual landmark, and it also was applying for a variance, to, for a number of variances to the New York City Zoning Code. So it's very interesting when you get applications like that, mm -hmm which involve not just the Landmarks Commission, but the City Planning Commission, the Board of Standards and Appeals. And that means that it first comes to us, it goes to the commission, then it comes back to the community board at the land use meeting. The land use is when the board sits as a committee of the whole. And then it goes back for the zoning variance approval or disapproval. And in the case of the Frick, which was a very controversial application, came to us a number of times because the first time, if you recall, they wanted to do away with the beautiful garden that was next to the museum. And that amazingly, or not amazingly, just got squashed immediately because the outcry from practically everyone was so huge. So then they had came back to us with a second proposal. And that, of course, was a very tough nut to crack. The neighbors across the street hired their own lawyer. You did get 200 people showing up at a committee hearing. And it takes a great deal of diplomacy to work your way through that. At the end of the day, it was really a split decision at the full board. And as you know, the, the city gave its approval to the expansion program for the Frick. Mm -hmm. Although I think for some people, you know, doing away with the music room there and building below the garden to put in a subterranean um, auditorium left kind of a bittersweet taste in some people's mouths. You know, it's, it, it's going to change the frick from a house museum to an institution, and that's what we felt so sad about. But in any case, now it's going to happen, and it's great for the city because it is a magnet for tourists, and that produces revenue, and it also is an incredible collection. That's true. We were chatting just before the filming. Um, you were on this program incredibly 10 years ago, and, and actually you, viewers, if they want to see that, they can actually see the library of old programs. And um, back then, some of the uh, other controversies, other arts-related uh, institutions, the Guggenheim wanted to build a tower, uh, Park Bernay had some other uh, controversies. And um, so it's really not just people with um, uh, the townhouses, but it, you, you deal with a lot of these, these larger institutions. Yes, we do. That's a good point, Monica. The Park Burnett, that beautiful building, 980 Madison Avenue, Abby Rosen, who owns a couple of very prominent office buildings, Lieber House and the Seagram's building, wanted to put a tower on top of that building. And was designed by a very prominent architect. Uh, the name eludes me right at the moment. What was fun about that hearing for, from an individual perspective is that you really see the passing scene of New York City because so many prominent people came to testify on behalf of A.B. Rosen. And I found that just very interesting. You know, the community board were really just advisory to these city agencies and people volunteer their time. And we don't consider ourselves, you know, really players in that New York sense. So it is fun to get an application where you see a parade of players coming right in front of you. And the same thing with the Frick where you had um, Annabelle Seldorf, who was the architect of record coming. You know, it really is interesting to me. The other thing, which I'll just throw in there, because you're right about these, the Guggenheim, and I, that, of course, was not a landmark when it came to us, because you have to, to be an individual landmark, you have to be at least 50 years old. And when that application came to us, the Guggenheim was not 50 years old, but it was within the Carnegie Hill Historic District. 
um, which thanks to one of our members, Elizabeth Ashby, even exists because she was the one who fought for it years and years ago. She's a great treasure, and we have her on our Landmarks Committee, and we value her opinion on every issue. But um, I was going to say um, that one interesting sidebar dealing with these very well-known architects, it was Huron and De DeMiller that came, it was um, Roman Abramovich, one of the Russian tycoons that we're reading about so much right now, bought three adjacent houses on one of the blocks in the 70s that's... Um, within the Upper East Side Historic District, and the architect coming to present these beautiful, incredible drawings, especially for the rear elevation. It's just a treat. It is. And that's why I really enjoy being on the Landmarks Committee. As a sidebar, I've been involved sort of peripherally in New York City politics since I, 1968, when I first worked on Robert Kennedy's presidential campaign, then was on the paid staff of a city council person, so I, and then was a Democratic district leader. So I've done a lot of different things in my time. It shows how old I am. But I felt very fortunate to be appointed the first time to the community board by Carolyn Maloney, who was then our city council person, in 1988, and then rotated off, and then came back after being involved with what we call the city neighbors fight, which was a city bank building at 91st in Madison, which was quite glamorous because Woody Allen happened to live right around the corner and was opposed to this rooftop addition that Citibank was planning on this non-contributing building within the Carnegie Hill Historic District. And that was really a collision of the Landmarks Preservation Law and the Madison Avenue Special Preservation District, which does allow a building to go up 210 feet. And through years of sitting with a, out at a card table and collecting petition signatures and testifying at the commission, Jennifer Rabb was then the head of the planning commission. She's now the president of Hunter College. We got it lowered to 12 stories. And that's how I got to know Eva Moskowitz, because you always draw in on these huge issues. Mm -hmm. The locally elected officials, they play such an important role. So I got to know Eva Moskowitz, who was the city council person for the Upper East Side, and she appointed me the second time to the community board. And then in 2000, I guess, I don't know, six maybe, I became co-chair. Okay. First with, oh, I've had various co-chairs over the years, but I've loved working with David Halper and the current co-chair. Have you been on any other committees or has it only been nine months? Well, no, I have actually, I tried out other committees. The Technology Committee, the, I used to go to a lot of Parks Committee meetings, but my true love and, you know, intellectually is really the Landmarks Committee. And just so that our listeners know or our viewers know, it's not always these huge projects like, for instance, the new plaza in front of the Metropolitan Museum. That came to us and we got to hear Emily Rafferty talk about it and they used some famous, world famous landscape design firm from Philadelphia to design the plan. But it's also if somebody just wants to, an apartment owner wants to maybe pierce the original historic fabric of their apartment with a through the wall air conditioner. And we really draw the line at that. That's one thing we really care about. We also care about windows. I think what's great now in New York is that these apartment buildings and their boards are going back to the original historic windows. There was a big move, gosh, 20 years ago, even 15 years ago, to put in the single plate windows on Fifth Avenue, you know, the view and everything. But I, we want to see the windows that the original architect for the building intended. So we always go for the historic windows. So it's not just these huge projects that come to us. It can be these very, very little projects. An apartment owner wants to change the design of a terrace. And of course, it's interesting, Monica, when I sit here and talk to you, I realize that we're talking about one of the most landmark districts. They're the most affluent neighborhoods in the entire city. So it's a, it's a very interesting world to look at, to put under the microscope. It is. It's very complex. Yes. Because and it is amazing, the, uh, all the different architects who have contributed to um, our, our community with their works that um, that you 
been very familiar with. In fact, the original program you did years ago, you brought a couple of books. I do have two sort of Bibles, the AIA Guide to New York City, which is marvelous oh, let's... and contains maps of mm -hmm. all the historic districts. And right. you can see that I have yep. Post-its in here. Right. And we can just turn to any one of these pages. 980 Madison, which I looked up in here, that was the Sotheby's, um, that is the former Sotheby's Park Burnett building. It's the Architectural Guide to New York City, which yeah. used to be my Bible, but now everything is online, Monica. So I just Google the address and, you know, you get all the information. Mm -hmm. But in the olden days, before that happened, it is very true. I really did depend on some of these compendiums. You know, even a, a dictionary of architectural terms I used all the time. Mm -hmm. So you're absolutely right that, and I'm, that's cute that I brought them with me. Yeah, it's a great episode, and yeah. you could actually see the books. I, I happen to like paper books myself. I, yeah. you know, I, you, you have to use the internet, but it's, um, uh, it is uh, the point being it's very complex because um, there's been so much development over, you know, a couple of centuries. Well, absolutely. Um, but most of the Upper East Side, the landmark, the beautiful brownstones that you see, were really built at the end of the 19th century. And the apartment buildings that we loved, Rosario Condella, J.E.R. Carpenter, those were really built before the mid-century, mid-century, 20th century. Now we're seeing an interesting development, sort of a sidebar, that a lot of the newer apartment buildings in the more affluent neighborhoods on the Upper East Side are being built in the pre-war style. I'm thinking of Peter Penoyer, who is completed a building on East 78th Street, and now he's just about, the building is almost finished being constructed on Madison Avenue between 79th and 80th Street. And there, you, the, Peter Penoyer and other architects are using that pre-war vernacular to express their buildings, mm -hmm. which I think is wonderful, instead of just glass curtain walls. But if we, you don't see many glass curtain walls, really, within these historic districts. But some of the historic districts are all little low-rise um, buildings. I'm thinking of um, the historic district that's across from Carl Schurz Park, where there are little muse houses. That There are no big buildings there at all. It's so sweet. It's just sort of a two-block area of darling little muse houses. So it's not all Rosario Candela apartment buildings. And you do get prominent architects from the past on the side streets as well. And luckily, on the east side, the, the zoning is low in scale. That's why you see the bigger buildings on the avenues and the smaller buildings on the side streets. Until the blood center situation. Yes, and that is not within a historic district, so mm -hmm. it never came to the Landmarks Committee, right. which is unfortunate. Well, it went to zoning. And, yes. And uh, the city just ignored what was voted on by the well, they did. And that is the irony. You can have such community outrage over an issue as we did with the city neighbors, the non-contextual building at 91st and Madison. If there had been a plebiscite among the voters, it would have just stayed, you know, like a five-story building to match the, its neighbors. But instead, Landmarks takes a broader view. Mm -hmm. And we have to respect their decision, you know. Mm -hmm. You have to be nice to everyone and right. civil, um, even if you feel that the application is not as complete as it should have been or that the drawings don't really show exactly what the um, applicant wants to do with his site. So you're right. It is very complicated. Oh, you kind of touched on earlier other committees that you may intersect with. Is that, is that a right way to say it? Um, because Yes, it is a right way to say it. The only two we really intersect with are sometimes the zoning committee. If an applicant comes in with a, what we call a 74711 under the zoning code, an example of that would be um, that beautiful apartment building, Rosario Candela's last apartment building at 19 East 72nd Street, if you apply for a 74711, you first come to Landmarks, but the intent is to have a preservation purpose if you're also applying for a, a variance to the zoning code, which they were doing because they wanted to put in retail on the ground floor. So that is where you see the intersection of the zoning and 
the landmarks. Another example, we interface sometimes with the transportation committee because of an applicant, say for example, a brownstone on East 78th Street wants to build out into the public way, which would be the sidewalk, even if it's three inches, they're expanding the area way in front of their property. The area way being where they put the trash cans and where the entrance to the building, the actual front door might be. That's the transportation committee is really in charge of anything that goes into the public way. So it comes to us and then it goes to the transportation committee. So we do interface mainly with those two committees. That's fascinating. Yeah, you might not have. It's all fascinating. It is. What are some of the broader longstanding issues that you see coming to Landmark? What we see right now is that the Landmarks Commission is not fully staffed. You know, they're they just don't have a big enough budget. It's one of the smallest city agencies. It plays such an important role in how our city presents itself to the world out there. You think of when you go to the Metropolitan Museum, you want to see those charming side streets and feel you're getting a taste of old New York. But the commission, and this is an issue for us, we find that issues are being decided at the staff level that we feel should actually come to the community board and then go to the commission. So there's no way we have of reviewing what the applicant is doing because it gets decided at staff level. And one of the reasons for that is that it's just easier for them to have that be the decision. Do you meet with the commission? No, never meet with the commission. The only time I've really seen the commission in action is when I was involved with this um, land use fight and then I would go down and testify before the commission. The commissioners are appointed by the mayor. I know that sometimes commissioners are even removed if they don't want to follow the agenda the mayor has set. We don't really have that problem with applications in our neighborhood, but in other neighborhoods in the city, I think it's more problematic. Getting more into the workings of the community board, and is there one achievement that you were involved with that stands out to you? Well, that's such an interesting question, Monica. I think it's one thing I'm very proud of is that we work together as a committee. We, I try to, even though I might not want to go down that road sometimes, but I, the more, we have a couple of people on the committee who really care passionately about various issues. And I like to think that we are giving them a forum to express their opinion. There's no one single thing that I could say is something that I'm so incredibly proud of. I'm just proud of the way we try to be as transparent as possible. We allow everybody who comes to us, unlike at the full board meetings where there's a time limit on how long you can speak, we allow each person to speak for as long as they want to. And if that's a hundred people speaking for 10 minutes apiece will just sit there because that's our role to listen to them. They are the public. So I'm just proud of the way the committee has worked over the last, I don't know, it has been a long time, but I'm just proud of the way we work, proud of the resolutions we come up with. David and I try to do a good job of presenting them to the full board. We now are including drawings. We never used to do that. That's a, over the last Three years, maybe it started with Zoom. We have now presented drawings so that the community board members and the public who come to the full board meetings can see what the project's all about visually, because you know a picture is worth a thousand words. So that's what I'm really proud of, the way the um, committee has been run, the way David and I run the committee, I guess you'd say. It's evolved, yes. for sure. Yes. Brings up another question about term limits on community boards. What are the pros and cons, in your opinion? Well, I don't know. I think it should be up to the voters, you know, even for our city council members. I don't really believe in term limits. I know that this has been a big issue um, for presidents on down in our country. But I think for the community board, you do need the institutional memory. I'm not saying I'm a perfect example as bringing an institutional memory to the Landmarks Committee, but
but certainly we have members of the committee. Elizabeth Ashby, who I mentioned before, she is so knowledgeable about the zone, the New York City zoning resolution, which is so complicated. So to have her explain things to us is so invaluable. And I try to think, what would our committee be like if she weren't there? So, and of course, I like being on the community board. So I don't, I've never been in favor of term limits for community board members. I know our recent city council member, Ben Kalos, he was for term limits. He said, because there are people who wanted to be on the community board who couldn't get on it because there were so many people like me holding on to their spots and constantly reapplying. But on the other hand, if we weren't doing a good job, I'm sure we, we wouldn't be there anymore. Um, the, the because it, the, the chair of the board, it's at his discretion to ask that we get reappointed. And I think it's honored by the borough president and the two city council members. And I've always tried to do other things which have been fun for me. The street fairs, I've always signed up for one it's been such a great way to get to know community board members one-on-one. -on -one. And the thing I really haven't liked, if I may throw this in, is our Zoom meetings. I haven't met the, for the last three years the crop of new appointees. I see them on Zoom, but it's not the same as actually meeting them face-to-face -face or seeing them at our monthly board meetings or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping one day that we'll get back to in-person meetings. I know there are members who want to have sort of a hybrid model, but I really feel for what we do as volunteers, it's important to get to know your fellow community board members and it creates collegiality too. Now you, you actually mentioned Elizabeth Ashby. Any other um, talented people that you have worked with on the community board that, uh, that come to mind? Well, I th mentioned briefly um, Alita Camp mm -hmm. and Michelle Birnbaum. They are passionate about preservation. And I really credit Alita especially with an issue that came to Landmarks because it's in the Turtle Bay Historic District, 210 East 62nd Street, a very complicated application that first came to us in 2016. And because of Alita, she has made sure that we have had tunnel vision and focused on that issue to the point where even Landmarks had a special meeting with us and the community because of this property where the applicant was just disobeyed the landmarks law by building a larger addition at the rooftop, at the rear, that was not in his original application. And then just sort of stopped work on the building so that it's been open to the elements, which you know in a place like New York means rats and flood water at the below grade and that spreads to other buildings. And she single-handedly got, I think, kept it writing to the commission, bringing it to our attention at the committee level, bringing it to the full board, allowing the neighbors to have a forum at the community board, at the landmarks and at the full board. And then landmarks finally reversed and said they were going to ho hold a hearing on their second application, which they weren't going to do. Very unfortunately, um, or fortunately, the applicant then withdrew the second application just recently and said they're going to go back to their original 2016 plan, which means they have to remove part of the roof and part of the back. But it also meant Landmarks wasn't going to hold another hearing. And that was a big disappointment to all of us who really wanted the commission, the commissioners to hear from the community. But it was, I, I credit with Michelle Birnbaum and Alita Camp for making sure we didn't, we kept our eyes on the prize, I guess you'd say. I'm trying to think over the years, you know, David Liston was a great co-chair. He formerly was chair of the board and he actually appointed me as landmark, as co-chair. There have been some great people, Barbara Chalky. I mean, my goodness, I really miss her. She's so good on broader issues like affordable housing. You know, you know, one of the reasons, Monica, which I've loved being on the community board, it keeps me involved with what's going on in our neighborhoods. Um, and I'm sure you feel that way too as a public member of your committee. And I just think that too many people don't understand how government really works in this city. 
they're very narrowly defined about their own world. And I understand that if you have to work and you have a family to raise and you have to put food on the table. But it's so important to also think about your larger community that you're a member of. Yeah, you know, uh, you mentioned the street fairs before, and, and there's always a table at almost all street fairs for the community board to try to introduce people to the community board. And it is amazing. About 80% of the people they stop by, they're looking for something free, or, and they have no idea what a community board is. No, and we have the nice handouts to give them. Yeah. which is great. And we always tell them, you know, please call the district office and, you know, there's a staff there and they can help you with whatever your issue is. Mm -hmm. But what I've enjoyed the most is just getting to know individual members like Vanessa Aronson. I wouldn't know her at all unless she had been on a street fair with me. So it's that informal one-on-one -on -one that I've enjoyed the most. Well, a way a lot of people also get to be aware of community board, especially landmarks and actually street life is the postings that go oh, up postings. Uh, all over. And I know that's how my husband and I first learned about the community board because it was oh, the planning of the 2nd Avenue subway. And there was a posting for one of the, the pre-meetings. And I think that how some people get involved in it or there's a case where there's a controversy. I keep bringing up that blood center. Um, at my building, um, somebody who lives next door to the blood center at Stop By was, was asking you know, for you know, whoever was... Um, uh, representative of the tenants or the condo board, and somebody called me down because I'm on our board. And I said, I, you know, you've got to go to the community board. And so that's how these things tend to happen. It's unfortunately, it seems to be when there's a problem. Well, I agree with you. The community won't get involved until they feel that it's so egregious, whatever is going on. And we saw that with Lenox Hill Hospital, Northwell Lenox Hill when they were going to put a tower up as part of their project, they were going to put a luxury condo at the corner of um, 76th Street and Park Avenue. And that just galvanized all those co-op boards of those beautiful apartment buildings, expensive apartment buildings along that strip there. And then Gail Brewer became involved and started holding meetings. But that was because they these neighbors did not want to see a high-rise luxury condo building in their beautiful neighborhood. And lo and behold, the, the developer, which was Northwell, withdrew it. That aspect, I don't know what's happening with the hospital now, but you're absolutely right. The community gets involved when they see that there's, it's affecting their own self-interest. That's as, you know, it's just human nature. Well, you know, it's funny, when uh, I visit other towns, a lot of people, regular citizens, they make a point to go to their school board meetings, to their town hall meetings. It is such a problem here to get people involved. This is one reason we have this program. Right. So, and people will tell us that they were um, at a restaurant and the program comes on. <laughs> so it's one way to try to get people to pay attention to what's going on with the community board and especially landmarks. Well, it's such an important thing that the communities know and it's always an issue. Everybody who runs for the chair of the board, they're always asked, what would you do to improve um, the community board's visibility within a neighborhood, the many neighborhoods that comprise community board aid? It's a very tough nut to crack. The best example of an involved entire community is Carnegie Hill Neighbors, mm -hmm. Lo Vandervoch. They have managed somehow to create a grassroots organization that does attract a real following and supports that organization financially. We are now seeing on the upper, uh, the other organization a little farther south where I live are Friends of the Upper East Side Historic Districts with Franny Eberhardt, and she has really put that organization on the map. They took a lead role with the Blood Center, which you keep mentioning. They got very involved with 210 East 62nd Street, they have really reached out through their newsletter, through their educational programming. They're doing a marvelous job. So those organizations for some attract audiences that somehow the community board is in, doesn't, doesn't have the um, wedge to get in there and attract. I don't know how you put it, but I'm really impressed with those two organizations. And we at Landmarks kind of depend on them 
if any building is within the Carnegie Hill Historic District and comes to the Community Board 8, they are Johnny on the spot. Lo Vandervoch, the president, testifies that for every single application that his um, organization is involved with. The Friends of the Upper East Side Historic Districts, they have, do have a preservation committee. They hear the applications. They come to our Landmarks Committee, but they generally don't speak unless I personally call on them and say, have you taken a stand on this issue or what are your thoughts or whatever? But we're lucky to have those two organizations in our midst. It is. It is a, they are great assets. Great yes, partners. great assets. Thank you. You mentioned very earlier on uh, in this, this conversation how you got involved with the community board. Um, any other community groups that you've been involved with, or has it been political? It's been more political when I look back. I am involved in other organizations, but not to the degree of the community board. And I have found it used to be we always had the land use meeting and the full board meeting two separate dates and then landmarks where we have to write up the resolutions that it's been really and i work full time as a school teacher so it's very hard for me to i mean i don't have the i bandwidth to do much more than what i'm doing so i really haven't i mean i do join these other like friends and carnegie hill neighbors and i support my church which is saint ignatius loyola so uh, those are organizations I financially support. If you work full time, it's very hard to be on the community board. And uh, politics was my passion in the past, but that now it's mostly community engagement through community board eight. So there are um, term limits that we mentioned. So your term may be yes. ending some. Well, I just got reappointed. I'm so happy, Monica. Oh. I just got a nice letter from our new borough president, Mark Levine. I think I probably have two more terms after this term, okay. if all goes well. And then I think it, it is time to step aside. I mean, my goodness, I'll be so old. Although, you know, with age comes wisdom, Monica, as you probably know, but I'll be, I, it's, you know, it's time, it is, you do want new blood on the community board, I mean, after a point. Would you stay so. involved with the community board if you're not? A well, I'd like to be a public member of the Landmarks Committee, mm -hmm. if I could. We only have two public members right now. Christina Davis, who used to be on the board and who is used to be the head of the Landmarks Preservation Foundation, the public-private fundraising arm of the Landmarks Commission. And she's very knowledgeable. And then we have Kimberly Selway, who used to be on the community board and then now is a public member of our committee. And she's wonderful, too. So we have two public members. Would they add a third if I were to step off? I would hope so, but I don't know. <laughs> well, with that, thank you so much for coming again on the program. So since you, you know, may be here for a little while longer, you know, maybe we'll have you again, get an update on Landmarks Committee. Well, I wish that I could really lend the gravitas, which my co-chair does, to every application because he can use the beautiful architectural lingo to describe things, and he's really excellent. But, you know, we're there for context and appropriateness. I should have said that earlier, but our mission is, is the application contextual? Is it appropriate for either an individual landmark or for a building within the historic district. That's our mission, context appropriateness. And we are so lucky, Monica, as you know, to be living in this beautiful city. Um, it's so special. It is. It's got an energy that can't be replicated anywhere else on earth. So thank you so much. And you're doing the best job of having all of us come and speak. And it's a research tool for generations to come, to come and view these episodes and see what community boards at a time and a place are all about. Yes. Thank you so much for being here. And thank you, everyone, for watching. And again, this has been CB8 Speaks, part of the Community Board of the Upper East Side and Roosevelt Island. And be sure to go to cb8m.com, where you can see the schedule for meetings, which uh, many are on Zoom. So thank you, and have a nice day. <laughs>